Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First, though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the Giving tab and choose Online Campus at your campus. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Well, good morning, Emmanuel Church. How are you feeling today? It is so good to be joining you, whether you're at the Banta campus, Franklin campus, Garfield Park campus, here at Greenwood, or if you're watching online, we want to welcome you. Also want to say hi to everyone sitting out in the lobby out there at the Greenwood campus. We see you. We feel you. We will have seats for you soon after COVID's over. So uh, anyway, uh, welcome to Emmanuel. And you know, today we're starting a brand new series. It's our Christmas series. Anybody excited about Christmas? Yeah. I've got my Christmas socks on right here today. It's a... Uh, I don't really know what, I think that's, anyway, happy Christmas socks. Last year, my wife bought me 12 pairs of Christmas socks, you know, for the countdown. So exciting. I'm wearing them already. Uh, But this is our Christmas series. And so welcome to Emmanuel. I want to jump right in today into some content, something that Jesus said, powerful words, perhaps some of the most powerful words that Jesus ever spoke, recorded in John chapter 14. Hang with me right here. Let's look. John chapter 14, Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. That's encouraging, right? Anyone? That's hope giving right there. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Watch this. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. Interesting statement. If it were not so, Jesus says, would I have told you that that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Then Jesus says this, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. We're starting a brand new series today called The Hope of Heaven. We have never done a series before on heaven in this church. This is the first time we're ever going to do it. You know, 2020 has been a difficult year. There has been all kinds of chaos in our lives. We've had COVID-19 hit us early March. And folks have gotten very sick. We've lost folks here at the church. Uh, Maybe some of you have lost loved ones. People are getting sick again. It's been a very difficult year with the pandemic. Job loss, um, just kids at home and school changes. And it's just been a headache. Has it not? Yes or no? There's been political unrest. There's been social unrest. It seems like 2020 has just been one huge disappointment. We were talking to some of our friends the other day. They have a a sophomore at Center Grove High School who's now on quarantine for the third time. It's like, oh my gosh, the kid's like spent more time at home than he has at school. Probably not, but that's what it feels like. I mean, it's just crazy what's going on. It's one disappointment after another after another. And I want to talk to you today about heaven because I believe that Heaven will infuse us with tremendous hope. You know, you look at the results of of 2020, and what you see see is is a lot of discouragement. You see people that are having high anxiety. Depression is up. Suicide is up. Divorce is up. People are really struggling today. John Eldridge wrote a book before the pandemic called All Things New. And in the book, I think he captures this sentiment. Now, remember, he wrote this before COVID-19. He said, there is just enough goodness in the world to rouse our hearts with expectation and plenty enough sadness to cut us back down. Then he makes this statement. I think this is kind of prophetic for where we're at today. He says, when the cutting down exceeds the rising up, you wonder if you shouldn't just stay down. You know, most of the time, you know, we have difficulty in life, but we also have enough goodness to weigh it out. But when the, when the cutting down exceeds the rising up, it's kind of it's like, man, I just throw the towel in. I'll just give up. And many people are doing that. Many people have done that. And I want to encourage you in this series over the next four weeks not to do that because there is reason to have hope. We could use a little hope today. Don't you agree? Yes or no? Now, hope, hope, you know, hope is like uh, this 
you know, squishy idea. It's hard to get your brain wrapped around. You know, you try to grab a hold of hope, and it, it's like the slime that your kids used to make. Remember this? It's like it slips through your fingers. It's just, it's kind of vague, and it's kind of like, what really is hope? It doesn't seem like a solid idea. And yet, the Apostle Paul says three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. Wow, that's, a, that's, not a, that's not a huge, you know, that's not a lot of things. Only three things will last forever, and one of those things is hope. And the reason he says that hope will last forever is because hope is a very concrete idea. It might seem vague, it might seem soft or squishy or hard to get your brain wrapped around, but I'm going to share a couple of ideas with you today that will let you know that hope is something you can build your life on, and it's something that we need. Let's start with a definition, the biblical definition. Hope is the confident expectation of a good coming to us. That's what hope is, biblically speaking. When I was a kid growing up, I had two older brothers, and from the age of 12, 13, 14, 15, our parents would take us to this water park called Action Park. It was right across the, the river in New Jersey. We grew up in Staten Island, and so we would take a trip over to New Jersey every summer. And Action Park was built on a, in a ski resort. So it was in the winter, it was a ski resort. In the summer, it was, a, it was a, a, a water park. This water park was insanity. Okay, that's all I have to say about it. It was crazy. Whoever made this water park, did not check with, you know, OSHA or whoever or some safety people. They just made up a bunch of rides that were insanely fun and adventurous and insanely dangerous, okay? So for a little boy, 12, 13, 14, it was heaven. It literally, like, when my mom said, hey, guess what? On July 16th, we're going to Action Park. Whoa! You know, put the calendar on the, you know, put it on the calendar because we love Action Park because there's all these slides that no one else has and, you know, you, you do this and you're in tubes and you jump off cliffs and there's this Tarzan swing, you go down. I mean, it was crazy. The drops and the slides and the, they had this one slide. It wasn't even a slide, it was a tube. And you climbed up this huge ladder way up into the sky, and you got in a tube like a, like a, like a bullet, like a, uh, and you'd come down, you'd st shoot straight down. The whole thing was a tube, so you're total, in total darkness. And then you would go in a circle in a water slide, and then it would shoot you out. And every time we would go to, to you know, it would be closed. It was like, oh, man, you know, how come the tube is closed? And there was a reason that it was closed, but we'll talk about that in a second. But, but man, they had all kinds of rides like that, you know? And, and so we just had a blast. And, 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 and what we were experiencing as kids at that time, me and my brothers, was this thing called hope. Because as soon as my mom said, we're going on January or July, whatever, or August, whatever, every day had excitement. I mean, we would count down. How many have a countdown right now for your Christmas on the wall somewhere, like we do in our house, like, oh, 18 days left. We would count down the days until Action Park because it was heaven on earth for little boys. Now, I don't know if you heard about the little documentary that HBO Plus has put out called Class Action Park. Anybody heard of it? You gotta pay $14.95 to get it, so we don't have that, but anyway. I saw some YouTube coming attractions for it, and needless to say, they shut down Action Park because apparently six people died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not one, not two, six. Two died in the wave pool because the waves, you know, caused them to drown. One died in the Tarzan swing because it was so high and the water was so cold. The guy went into, he had a heart attack. But man, I'll tell you what, there was this, I'm not like happy about that or anything. It was just, just this, is, this is action park. It was dangerous. They shut down the one tube that did like this because what they found when they opened it up were people's teeth. They were getting stuck in the water slide because they'd go around and then they'd land face plant and then it would just take their teeth out. It's unbelievable. Like these class action park, check it out. Check it out. But for a little kid, wow, this was heaven. I'm not kidding. What was it? It was the confident expectation of a good coming to us. Thankfully, none of the children died that, those summers. We all survived, but it was a lot of fun. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little fun, but in reality, when, when you live without hope, and many people are today, the eyes lose their brightness, and you've seen it. Maybe you've seen it when you look in the mirror at yourself, but you've certainly seen it in other people. The eyes lose their brightness. The energy in a person and a human being drains out of their body. They struggle to get out of bed. They struggle to go to work. 
to struggle to do the normal things. That's the loss of hope. If they're in a marriage, the marriage begins to fade. If they struggle with, dis- uh, with, with depression, it, the depression becomes severe. It settles in in a way that it's never settled in before. This is what happens with when a human doesn't have hope. The overall thinking becomes this. Who really cares anyway about anything? You see, hope to the soul is important as oxygen is to the body. We human beings need it to survive. What is hope? It's this confident expectation of a good that's coming to us, and it produces life, vitality, energy, passion for living, even in the midst of difficulty and hardship and trouble and pain. It's possible to die emotionally and be alive physically. And some of you are like, man, you're talking about me today. I know, because this has been a hard year. It's been a hard year to find passion and vigor and vitality to live this life. That's, how, that's why the Bible refers to hope as an anchor for the soul. Did you know that? In Hebrews chapter 6, this is what the Bible says about hope. We who have fled to God for refuge can have great confidence as we hold on to or cling tightly to the hope that lies before us. We're going to talk about what that hope is in a second. What is that hope that lies before us? It is heaven. Listen to what he says. This hope is a strong and trustworthy, say it with me, anchor for the what? The soul. Think about that. Think about the language. Why does a ship need an anchor? It's because the, sometimes the ocean is just stormy and rocky and the boat, it's turning the boat, it's flipping the boat, it's taking the boat. That's how life is. Some, that's how 2020 has been. And what you and I need is this anchor to root us down, to hold us steady in the midst of the storm. That is what hope does. It's this confident expectation of a good coming to us and it settles things down in our soul. And so Jesus says, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Think about the language Jesus uses. My Father's house. You guys know what a house is? Anybody live in a house? Yeah? Apartment? Yeah? You know about houses, right? We know about houses. In my Father's house, there's many rooms. Anybody know anything about a room? Anybody live in a room? Do you live in a room? Anybody? Most of us probably live in a room. We know about rooms. Think about the language Jesus uses. My father's house, there's rooms. There's a place. Why does Jesus use these three words? House, rooms, place. He, he, the reason he uses these words is because he knows we have houses, we have rooms, we have a place. We get it. And what Jesus is saying is that in the same way that we have a house or a room or a place right now where we dwell or live, there's, there's, there's one coming to us in the future. And he does that to infuse hope into us. Here's what Jesus knows to be true. And if you get nothing else from this series, just get this one idea. It'll change your life. Jesus knows this, that hope for the future gives strength for today. See, it was the reality that that I knew that in a few weeks we were going to go to Action Park that gave me excitement. We talked about it. Oh, remember this ride and that cliff and we can slide down. Are you going to go on that one? Oh, that one's too dangerous. That one's too high. Maybe I'll try that one. Maybe it was, see, hope for the future in Action Park gave us passion and vigor to live today. That's what hope does to us. And that's why Jesus talked about heaven. When you read the New Testament, that's what you see. Let's look at one example. In Matthew chapter 19, I want you to see this. Jesus is talking to his disciples and it says this in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Jesus replied, I assure you that when the world is made new or when the entire world is restored or regenerated, because that's what that word means. Three English words make up one Greek word. When the world is made new, when the world is palingensia, that's the Greek word that Jesus used. It means to regenerate. It means to renew. It means to restore. Jesus says, when I bring heaven to earth, you know, a lot of us think about heaven as this place that we're going to go after we die that's somewhere beyond the stars, And maybe there's some clouds there and we jump around from cloud to cloud and we sing songs like Amazing Grace for 10,000 years, right? We've, We've maybe heard about heaven like that. It's this weird place that you go and God's there and, you know, it's just we just kind of hang out and sing. Sounds like an eternal worship service in church. 
Now, if that's heaven, I don't want to go. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not down on church. I like church for about an hour, okay? And, 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 and I'm a pastor, right? So, so if church, if heaven is going to be this eternal worship service where we're singing to God, you know, like, are there any other options, you know? Not that I want to take the other options, but, but, but that's not heaven. That is not heaven. See, in Revelation 21, starting in verse 16, it says that heaven, and I don't want to freak too many people out, but I, I got to describe this a little bit. This is kind of awkward and weird, especially if, you've, if you're uh, not a Christ follower and you've never heard this before. But when Jesus says, I'm going to make all things new, when I'm going to renew and restore everything, what he's talking about is bringing heaven to earth. Did you know that heaven is going to be on earth? Yeah, right here. That God is going to restore earth, and there is going to be this, there's no other way to say it, this gigantic cube. Yes, that's right, a cube. Check it out, Revelation 21, verse 16. It's going to come down out of the sky, and it's going to land on earth. It's going to be 1,400 miles wide. It's going to be 1,400 miles high, and it is going to be a city. And it is, if you're struggling with how big that is, think about a city that would go from Canada to Mexico and from the Appalachian Mountains all the way to California. Two million square miles this city will be. And it'll go all the way up into the outer space, considering right now, our atmosphere right now, 1,400 miles high, 1,400 miles wide. It's a cube. And in that city, God will dwell and we will dwell. And it will be the capital of heaven on earth. Heaven is not this place that we go to way out there beyond the stars and it's weird and it's vague and it's, it is life. What happens in a city? Well, there's culture and there's music and there's jobs and there's authority and we do things and there's sports. Everybody excited about that? Sports in a city? Like heaven is a place. In my father's house, there's lots of rooms. It's a place. There's a place for you. There's a place you're going to live. There's a house you're going to live in. There's an apartment you're going to live in. See? This is a place that we go to. So when Jesus says, I assure you that when, this, when the world is made new, he's talking about an actual physical place. And then he says this to his disciples. When it's made new and the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne, you who have been my followers, he's talking to the 12 disciples, will also sit on 12 thrones judging 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. And verse 29, and everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive, watch this, a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. What is he doing? He's saying, guys, I know it's, some of you have left, like think of James and Peter. They left behind their fishing business to follow Jesus. Like they have no income. Like, I know some of you have left your business to follow me. You think of Matthew, the tax collector. He left behind his whole career as a, a wealthy tax collector. He left it. He had no income. So, see that? I know some of you have left behind lifestyles and families and children and stuff to, to follow me. Because it's costly to follow Jesus. If you're, you're really going to dive into it. But I assure you, when I make all things new, when the cube comes down, Revelation 21, verse 16, when it comes down and rests on earth, I will restore to you, I will pay you back a hundred times what you've given. So if you've given $100, I'm just giving an example. 100 times 100 is 10,000. If you gave 100 hours, I'm going to give you, I'm going to bless you with a, a, a 10,000. Whatever, if you give me 100 of something, I'm, I'm going to bless you with 10,000 of it. What is he doing? He's infusing hope. And what is hope? Hope is the confident expectation of a good that is coming to us. Jesus always talked about heaven. Imagine the energy and the passion and the vigor that the disciples felt when Jesus would say things like this. Think about me and my, my brothers with Action Park. Think about you with that thing when the, when the baby's coming or you're going to get the house or you're going to get the new job and there's that thing out front, you're going to go on the cruise. And, and every day leading up to that, it's like, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. I know it's difficult, but it's coming. That is the power of hope. Hope for the future gives strength for today. Yes? Is this making sense? And we need that today. We need that today more than ever. And so that first Christmas morning, this is a Christmas series. What does this have to do, about, uh, do with Christmas? Well, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, when he was born in that stable, when Mary, his mother, Joseph, his father, placed him in that manger, what happened? 
But the process of restoration began. In your notes, I wrote it like this. Jesus was born to begin the process of restoration, of making all things new. God is not going to do it like this in in a moment. It is a long process. So Jesus is born that first Christmas morning. And he lives 30 some years and he dies on a cross. And three days after he dies on the cross, he rises from the grave. Why? To reconcile mankind, to begin the process of restoring all of creation and human beings back to his father. See, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve messed it up. They blew it. Like in the Garden of Eden, before they sinned, before they disobeyed, they, they, like, like Eden was perfect. Theologians call it original glory. There was no jealousy. There was no insecurity. There was no sexual sin. There was no anger. There was no murder. There was no racism. There was no evil. There was no sin. And they blew it. They blew it. He ate the apple. I should say, Eve ate the apple. First but then knucklehead Adam did it too. I mean, they're both boneheads. Like, and don't think for a second that you wouldn't have done it because <laughs> I would have done it too. They listened to the serpent. They sinned. They disobeyed God. They didn't trust God and they blew it. And the theologians call it the fall. All of humanity is plunged into this thing called the fall and now sin enters the world. And, and, and Adam and Eve's first son kills, their second son, Cain, kills Abel. I mean, one generation from the beginning and there's a murder. This is terrible. Things have gone wrong. And so what, is happens, what happens on Christmas morning is the process of Jesus reversing the curse of sin and death and to, to eliminate murder, to eliminate lust, to eliminate deceit and lying and hatred and anger and all the sin that came with the fall. But right now, we're in the middle of events. I don't know if you know that or not. 2,000 years ago, Christ rose from the dead and then Jesus talks about this promise of palingensia, all things new. We don't really know when that's going to happen. It seems like it might happen soon. But in between, there's you and me. And we're in this waiting period where the gospel is going out and the good news of, of forgiveness is going out and we can find peace. But, but we also know that we still sin and there's still pain and there's still evil in the world and there's still injustice in the world. And so we're like, it's good, but it's bad. And it's good and there's bad. And oh my gosh, there's joy and then there's pain. And, 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 and we're waiting, we're waiting for this next event to happen, which is Christ coming back. That's where we live. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8, this, this space between, this, this waiting period. And he says that all of creation, like creation itself, was subjected to the curse. And that's where volcanoes come from. And that's where hurricanes come from. And that's where earthquakes come from. And that's where pandemics come from and disease. Like creation is subject to the curse of sin. And then he says that we too groan, Romans chapter 8. Creation is groaning, waiting for restoration, waiting for Christ to return. And we believers also groan. Think of that word, groan. It's like, oh. It's like when you wake up in the morning. I don't know if anybody else has this, but it's like, oh. Anybody with the back pain, the lower back pain? Is it just just me? Every day, every day. Oh, what's that? I'm only 43. Why? You know, and then there's all the knee pain. Oh, it's the groan. It's the groan. It's the pain. He says, we believers groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, right? We have him as a foretaste of future glory. Like we know one day it's all going to be restored. It's all going to be renewed, right? But, but, but we still wait. We still, we're still holding on. We, we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Even though we're believers, we still sin. Anybody else honest enough to admit that? We still blow it. Like we have the Holy Spirit inside of us and we're believers and we, 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 like, we love Christ and we want to, but we still blow it, we still suffer, we still sin. Then he says this, we too wait, watch this, with eager, and here it is, say it with me, hope. We wait with eager hope for the day. See, we're in between events, the resurrection and the return of Christ. With eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as adopted children, including, oh, I love this part, the new bodies that he has promised us. <laughs> Some of you are going to get your hair back. You are. Anybody excited about that? You're going to get that color back. You know, you won't have to, you won't have to, you know, dye it and stuff. And you're going to, your skin's going to be restored. And, 
you know, the back pain's going to be gone, and, 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 and we're going to have, we're going to have new bodies, <clears throat> restored, regenerated, healed, such good news. But right now, we're in the middle. It hasn't happened yet. And that's what the hope is all about. What is hope? It is the confident expectation of a good that's coming, hasn't yet arrived. We live there, and we're supposed to live in it every single day. So what is this series about? Is it about heaven? Yeah, it is about heaven. We're going to talk about heaven. But really, it's about having hope. Because hope for the future gives me strength for today to live strongly today with vitality, with energy, with passion in the midst of political unrest, in the midst of social unrest, in the midst of the loss of a loved one, in the midst of the pain, you can live well because of this thing called hope. So we're going to talk about four specific hopes that we have in heaven. And we're going to talk about the first one today because I want you to have something tangible to get a hold of. I don't want you to just be like, okay, okay, so that was a good sermon. I think I'm supposed to hope that one day we're going to go to heaven. No, 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 no. That's not what we're saying today. We're saying there, there is tangible, there's something tangible for you to get your heart, your hands, your brain, and your soul around that's going to produce energy for you to live. Let me give you the first one today. The Bible teaches that hope, the hope of heaven is the removal of pain. This is so clear in the scriptures. There are two people that got an incredible glimpse into what heaven was all about. They actually saw into what heaven was. The Apostle Paul, we're not going to talk about him today, and another guy named John, who was one of Jesus' closest followers. He was called the, the, the beloved disciple. And he got this image, this revelation about what heaven was like. And some of it's weird. And if, if you've ever read the book of Revelation, you're like, what? Seven scrolls and seven trumpets and... It's confusing, but there are a couple of parts of Revelation that are super clear, and I want to show you one part, because it's a picture of what John saw about this new city. He calls it the New Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 21. Watch this. John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, restored, brand new, coming down from God, 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles high, out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. That's a really big bride right there, okay? <laughs> Just thought I'd point that out. Really brave. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. That's wrong. You're not supposed to say really big bride. Anyway, um, I heard a shout from the throne, and this is what the voice from the throne said. Watch this. Look, God's home is now among his people and he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be their God. Now we're gonna talk more about what this verse means in week three of this series. So park that in over here. We'll get back to it. I wanna focus today on the next verse. Powerful. Listen to this. John says, this is what it will be like in this new Jerusalem, in this new city. God will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be, watch this, No more death. You imagine. No more death. Do you know someone who lost a loved one recently? So painful. Physically painful. Or sorrow for any reason. Oh, you know, the divorce and now the relationship's broken up and we're not going to get to. And this year's been a constant year of disappointment. No more crying. Some of you cry frequently. Sometimes it's good to cry, but sometimes the, you just cry because the pain is overwhelming. And no more pain. All of these things will be gone forever. Now, I don't know about you, but... I haven't had a whole lot of personal pain this year, but I have walked with some folks who have had the worst pain that's humanly possible. This year in our church, two young men, 120, 115, were shot dead. I I can't even describe it. I can't even begin to assume what that even feels like to have your son shot and killed. I've got two. 
But I watched his parents suffer through the loss of a son. One day, the promise of heaven is that pain will be gone. I don't know how God's going to do it. But that, that's the promise of heaven. That one day, whatever pain it is that you're carrying, if it's the loss of a loved one, if it's the pain of regret, all things you wish you would have done, things that you did that you wish you didn't do, the pain of, 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 of some assault in the past, maybe it was a physical assault, a psychological assault, a sexual assault. There's so much rape in this world and sexual abuse and the pain goes down deep into the soul and it messes you up psych psychologically and makes you think that you're worthless or that you're not worthy of love and all of that pain that many of you live with because of the sexual assault, gone, gone. And again, I don't know how God's going to do it, but he is going to heal your soul. This is the hope. I'm not talking about vague theories of ideas that, oh, one day heaven's going to fix everything. No, there will be the removal of all of your pain. And listen, I would become a Christian for that reason alone. Because I would see my friends, myself, my friends, my family just be restored and have the pain lifted Emotional, psychological pain, physical pain, whatever it is. My friends, my dear friends who have cancer and they're dying. Gone. The physical pain of the cancer eating their body, gone. No more disease. This is real. And it's coming. And it's so much better than Action Park. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying today? Are you receiving it? I love the way John Eldridge talks about it in the book. He says this, referring to this event when Christ's return and the, and the New Jerusalem comes. He says, death is utterly swept away at the great restoration. And not only death, but every other form of sorrow, assault, illness, or harm you have ever known. Can you just imagine that with me? The pain that you've been carrying in your life, whatever it is, released restored. Let me ask you the question. What pain will be removed for you? What pain will be taken away when heaven arrives on earth, when Christ returns? What pain will be removed for your loved ones? when Christ returns. Imagine that. This is what God wants us to live in. This is what Jesus, he wants us to live there and dwell there because he knows that hope for the future brings strength for today. It's not over. <laughs> Let me say that again. It's not over. It's going to get better. You've got to hang in there, amen? You've got to hang in there. What have I said today? Hope is to the soul what oxygen is to the body. Hope is the confident expectation of the good coming to us. Hope for today gives strength for tomorrow. What's your action step? Hope. That's what you need to do. What do you do? Hope in heaven, hope in the return of Christ. Eagerly look forward to the good coming to you as a Christ follower. You know, I was quoting some verses earlier from Romans chapter eight about how bo our bodies groan and we look forward to the day when Christ returns so we can experience the full adoption as children of God and the release from sin and suffering and we receive our new bodies and that's a wonderful passage and it ends at verse 23. And then in verse 24, the apostle Paul tells us when we're supposed to receive, receive this hope. Look with, me, look, look with me at verse 24. We were given this hope when we were saved. Saved from what? Saved from our sins. See, as believers, we were supposed to receive it, live in it, in the moment we put our faith in Christ. 
So if you're a believer today and you're not living with this hope, you're overwhelmed with anxiety, fear, or discouragement. You're overwhelmed with pain. You want to throw in the towel. You're wondering to yourself, should I just stay down because the things that are cutting me down are outweighing the things that are the good things that are rising up. Listen, you've got to go back to the scriptures. It is your responsibility to keep the return of Christ on the forefront of your mind so that you can maintain energy, maintain vitality, maintain passion to live in the midst of the difficulty. That's on you. I can't do it for you. I can help. I can preach a sermon like this, but I can't infuse hope inside of you. You must do that. You must dwell upon the truth of the return of Christ every day, if you must, to maintain that hope. Jesus certainly gave us enough passages to do that. It is the next event in the, in the world, theologically. Do you understand? The next thing that God is going to do in the world, according to the Bible, is return to this earth. Amen? You have to keep that in front of you. That's your responsibility as a believer. Now, if you're not a believer today and you're like, man, I didn't know it was going to be like that. Yeah, it is going to be like that. The removal of all pain, the restoration of all things. No more suffering, no more death, no more sorrow. You need to opt into that deal. Christ died on the cross for you. Three days later, he rose again so that you can have that hope, so that you can be reconciled to God, so that you can have that future to look forward to in heaven. What will you do with that? My hope is that you'll receive it. My hope is that you'll be saved and receive that hope, that future hope of regeneration, restoration, and all things being made new. I'm gonna say a simple prayer. It's a prayer of faith. During this prayer, what you're doing, if you wanna opt in, is to put your trust in Christ. You're gonna say to Christ, I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I believe three days days later you rose again to cover my sin, to pay the penalty for my sin so that I could be forgiven, so that I could have hope, so I can have forgiveness. If you would like to do that, if you feel led to in this moment, if you feel drawn in, if you'd like to experience that hope, take these words, personalize them. Talk to God as if there's no one in the room but you and him. Do business with him. Place your faith in him and pray this prayer. Take these words, make them your own. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. That you took the penalty that I should have paid. I trust you today. Please wash me, cleanse me, and make me your child. Infuse me with hope today. I place my trust in you. I ask you to be my savior, my God, my Lord. And from this day forward, teach me to look forward to your return so that my life will be filled with strength today. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. Can we give God glory, church? Amen. Come on, nice and loud. If you just prayed that prayer, our church has put together a little starter kit uh, to kind of get you you started. We call it our saved box. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There is a New Testament in here. There is a, a coffee cup to say congratulations. And there's some instructions on how to get connected to the church and get baptized, all that fun stuff. So if you said that prayer, just text the word SAVE to 65248. We love to text around here. Do not text UGLY. That's the Christmas sweater thing. Don't do that. Text the word SAVE and we'll put one of those boxes in the mail for you. Can we give God glory one more time?